welcome to today's Cyber Threat Report. Today is September 8th, 2011. Uh, joining us today, we have Jim Clausing. Uh, Jim Clausing is a regular on our program here. He's an expert malware an analyst. Uh, he's also our connection to the malware analysis community. Welcome, Jim. Uh, what will you be dis discussing with us today? Uh, first off, we'll do a brief follow-up of last week's report about the DigiNotar uh, CA and some of the fallout from that in the last week. And then I'll talk a little bit about some new Android malware and some of the trends in that over the last six months to a year. All right, great. That should be some good discussion. And uh, next we have Dave Gross. Uh, Dave Gross is a senior incident response analyst on our team. He's also the lead for our malware analysis activities. Uh, welcome, Dave. Uh, what do you plan to discuss today? Thank you, Brian. I'm going to discuss uh, some fraudulent uh, trouble reporting on Google Places. I think you'll find the discussion really interesting. Great, thanks. And uh, we also have John Hogaboom. Uh, John is one of our uh, expert security analysts, uh, I would say uh, on the very much so, and also a tool developer. Uh, welcome, John. Um, what do you plan to discuss? Hey, Brian. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Anonymous. They recently released a new uh, d distributed denial of service. Actually, it's just a denial of service tool, um, and it's called the RefRef tool. We're going to take a closer look at that and break it down and see how it works. All right, great. That'll be uh, informative, I'm sure. And uh, I'm Brian Rexrod, uh, a sort of a host of the program here today, and also cover the, uh, the Internet Weather Report. And if you have any feedback on this program, we welcome your feedback. Uh, you can contact us at cyberthreatatlist.att.com. And uh, we look forward to your questions, uh, feedback, and also um, any uh, recommendations for topics we should cover. So uh, let's go ahead and move to Jim here. Uh, what's happening with the certificate generation pro process these days? Well, it's been a busy week. Um, we talked last week about the DigiNotar, the, um, they had suffered a break-in, and uh, most of the major uh, web browsers had disabled some of their uh, certificates. Uh, and what we've seen in the last week is that apparently the break-in was worse than originally thought. Um, basically, the uh, the update that Microsoft sent out uh, two days ago or so uh, it basically now um, doesn't treat any of the certs ever signed by DigiNotar as being legitimate. Um, and so we've seen a, an additional update to Firefox, another update of Chrome come out. I think Opera's got another one coming out today. Um, so. And the guys who broke into DigiNotar uh, now claim that they've also broken into four other uh, CAs, and they're not naming them. So now we've got now we see a, a lot of the other CAs scrambling to see if they're the ones that have been broken into. Uh, the guys that did this one um, appear to be the same guys that broke into Komodo. Uh, don't remember if that was earlier this year or late last year. Um, and it has started a, a lot of discussion in the security community about the, the issues with uh, SSL with um, public key infrastructure and, you know, who do you trust? Um, and, yeah, there, there's a lot of discussion going on right now and not a whole lot of answers. One of the other interesting and actually uh, somewhat worrisome aspect of this is while we've seen uh, Firefox, Microsoft, you know, Mozilla, Microsoft Opera, um, Google all update their browsers and or OSs, um, we haven't seen an update yet from Apple uh, for the Macs or Safari. And there, there have been a couple of articles out there on how to deal with this in some of the smart devices. But remember, your phones have web browsers that have to trust uh, CAs. And so how do you 
how do you disable the certificates in the, the iPhone or Android? Um, that's something that's still not entirely clear. That uh, it doesn't look like we've been getting updates from the uh, from the vendors like we have with some of the other stuff. So that's something we still need to be worried about. So I, I read a little bit about this case, and uh, I think um, if, if I remember correctly, about uh, they've identified about 500 or so certificates that had been generated uh, by these attackers. Is that correct? It's around that order. It was, it's, uh, it, the initial report last week was about 200. Uh, mm -hmm. Since then, they're saying five or 600. Right. But essentially. Um, most of the, the vendors, Microsoft, Mozilla, and uh, are, are saying don't trust any of them from this particular one. Essentially, this particular CA has been put out of business. Yeah, been so, taken so over. Uh, it appeared that one of the findings was that there were some, I guess, fundamental security flaws in their infrastructure as a part of the uh, sort of the follow-up investigation, which is, uh, as you said, it, it, it comes down to this question about who you trust uh, certification authorities are considered the top of the food chain in terms of security. Uh, there was a similar kind of incident associated with RSA and the secure ID tokens that is considered sort of a, you know, very significant uh, break in as, as penetrations ago. Now, I guess the other aspect of this that I've been sort of wondering about, do we have very strong credibility that the folks that are claiming did this are actually the ones that did? It, it looks like they probably are. Um, the, they've posted some claims to prove it, and uh, it, it looks like the ones who claim to have done it probably have. So, you know, their, their claim that they have broken into four other uh, CAs is, is a concern. Mm -hmm. you know, but there are so many of these CAs out there, you know, that that in itself is a bit of an issue that Moxie Marlin Spike talked about at uh, Black Hat this year. How many uh, CAs are built into the browsers uh, nowadays that everybody trusts? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know for sure how many are in the, the mainstream browsers, but I saw an article today saying that the CAs could uh, in some cases in the past have paid to get themselves included in the browser, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch that are in the browsers. Yeah, it's certainly more than a handful, um, and definitely more than it used to be 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens, uh, is there a way that uh, the users would notice uh, these fraudulent certificates, or? What, what's the implication from the user's standpoint? Now that's the thing is that they, it, by breaking into the CA, you know, the, the bad guys are able to generate certificates, you know, that are legitimate as far as anybody knows. You know, the the user will never be able to tell, you know, that this is a fraudulent certificate until, you know, until they go uh, and revoke it or revoke the. Uh, the, um, signing certificates. The main thing here is to make sure that your browsers are kept up to date. You pointed out the issue that it appears that Apple has not come up with the appropriate updates to uh, make sure that these uh, certificates, that it's the signing certificate has been removed from the browsers. And, um, you know, so long as um, that uh, signing certificate has been removed, it's going to kick off an error on the browser. Uh, it's important to, to uh, pick up on that error. You know, I think we talked about this last week. There still is this notion that, uh, you know, even at enterprise gateways, uh, certificate checking is one of the functions that really should be in place as well to make sure that uh, self-signed certificates and, and bogus certificates like this can't be used for some sort of, um, you know, data theft activity, for example. So. Yeah, well, in another place is in proxies. Uh, if you're doing um, man in the, you know, if you're, doing inspection of SSL traffic, then it's the proxies where you need to update these certificates and not necessarily the end user's browser, so. Right. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, that's very good uh, information there, Jim. I think we're gonna have more discussions about these uh, certificate generation activities in the future. And 
the organizations we depend on for security, I think, in general. Um, Dave, uh, let's see, we've got uh, some interesting abuse taking place here. What do you have? Yeah, this is a little bit different than uh, some of the other topics that we've uh, covered before. Um, basically, this uh, has to do with um, uh, online uh, directory listings and mapping and stuff like that. Uh, in particular, this one is about Google Places, although there are uh, other uh, vendors that have this issue as well. And uh, on Google Places, there are business listings with the address, the type of business, links, photos, reviews, a number of different things that are, you know, collected together. And uh, one of the uh, things there in order to maintain um, their listings, try to keep them up to date, is a place where anybody can go and click and report a problem. So if they've tried to use the map and uh, for some reason it's, uh, gotten them to the wrong place or whatever, they can, you know, report some issues. Well, one of the types of problems is this place is permanently closed. And um, there's been some fraudulent activity related to that. Uh, what winds up happening is when you click on the place is permanently closed, the status of the place is then changed to reportedly closed, and then Google will review it depending on how many um, how many times they get uh, that sort of a report, um, but they'll basically eventually uh, permanently close it. And uh, if uh, there's a competitor of that business or if there's somebody wanting to do uh, something uh, malicious, you know, something, uh, uh, you know, the, that uh, they have a, a um, bone to pick with that business or something like that, they can go in and just uh, click on that and uh, have it permanently closed. And there have been people that have this uh, repeatedly happening, and then they get uh, their uh, business open again, according to Google, and then it, it's closed. But, you know, the, the issue here is that when it's listed as permanently closed, people that are looking for a business to go to, they're going to avoid that location. So it can actually hurt that business because in the listing it says that that, that place is closed. Um, there, uh, in August, somebody had uh, done a trick on Google and actually reported Google's headquarters closed, and uh, you know they were doing it as a you know to show that there's a uh, problem with this thing and and needs to be uh, addressed. Um, there is a way. Uh, where it does say that it's closed, that uh, you can click on a link that says not true and get the thing reinstated. But some people have had issues with the time it takes to get reinstated. Other ones, um, as soon as they get it reinstated, it gets closed again because somebody's actively trying to close it and stuff like that. Um, so there's a number of issues there, and Google is working on changes to these features to co uh, combat the fraud. They haven't said exactly what they're doing to uh, fix it yet, um, but, um, you know, they're uh, trying to address it. And um, being local and Yahoo local also have similar issues, but Google is really the, the one with the most traffic here, so they're the ones that have the, the really big problem. And, you know, this brings up a topic of how do you do this um, collaboration across the general population? I mean, the, the whole idea here is that Google is giving these listings, but they don't really have um, direct linkages to the owners of the business to get reliable information there. And so they're relying on the general population to go in and, you know, provide updates and, you know, there are links there. If you're the business owner, click here and, and you can put more description and more information about this business and stuff like that. But it's all uh, anonymous in some way where, you know, you're just going in and, and putting this stuff in and it's, you know, collaboration uh, for everybody to do without any kind of authentication or verification. And, you know, this points to uh, one issue here, but it's uh, general across the web. There's more and more sites where, you know, you want to get this collaboration to um, get 
very useful information, but at the same time, how do you uh, deal with these bad actors that are uh, um, putting these false reports in? Yeah, so there, yeah. there's always going to be a bad apple out there, and I think that's one of the things that needs to be recognized. And uh, I think you alluded to this. This is basically sort of a crowdsourcing type activity here. And uh, it needs to, I think one thing that perhaps is missing in the existing model is that there isn't as much of an active input as to say this business does exist that is sort of uh, countering the business doesn't exist kind of scenario. And, uh, you know, I think perhaps there are some things that uh, can be learned from the way Wikipedia has been done that seems, to, at least in my opinion, has been pretty successful in its crowdsourcing capability. But right. I'm not sure how much fraud there's been on there where, you know, they've had to take down articles, but um, it seems to be uh, be pretty reliable, as you said. Yeah. Uh, while we were talking, I actually looked up Yelp, which is another kind of for restaurants and various things like that. That also has a feature like this where you can, you know, mark a business as closed. So that's another type of Avenue, and I was just looking at TripAdvisor, but I didn't get a chance to look through all here. But I imagine, like you said, there's probably other sites where they could, um, you know, uh, use the same tactic that they're using on Google. Mm -hmm. I'll just take a bit of a stretch here just to, to uh, provoke a bit of thought. This is a kind of thing where, you know, anytime you put in a feature that's intended to protect against some sort of abuse, I think uh, it's an uh, – important to think about how the feature that's supposed to prevent abuse or, or help to uh, protect against abuse could be used against you. And I think that's one of the things that we try to think about when we're putting together services, uh, a DDoS defense service, for example, to try to make sure that the service itself can't be turned around and turned into, in fact, a, an attack tool. And uh, this is a case where, you know, it's, a, it's kind of close to that. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks very much, John. That was very good. And uh, next we have uh, John. Speaking of uh, denial of service attacks, what do you have? Um, yeah, real quickly. So I'm sure most people that listen to the broadcast are familiar with the anonymous group. It's kind of a uh, hacktivism type uh, organization that goes about trying to uh, usually do mostly politically related types of uh, crowdsourcing, so to speak, um, usually DDoS attacks. They had something called a low-orbit ion cannon tool previously, which was a volunteerism type of uh, attack tool where they would instruct users run this tool, everybody attack this website that they don't like, and uh, hopefully take it offline. Uh, recently, uh, the anonymous group um, released a new tool. It's called the RefRef. Uh, DDoS attack tool. It was actually used uh, experimentally as kind of a test mode against a site they actually use uh, called Pastebin uh, probably about a month or so ago uh, just to prove that it would actually work. And then uh, recently they tested again against WikiLeaks. Um, someone from the anonymous group claims that they had a little disagreement with the uh, WikiLeaks uh, organization or the guy who runs WikiLeaks, which actually WikiLeaks and Anonymous have kind of been associated hand-in-hand in, hand in the past as well. Um, in any event, uh, uh, it appears that um, they use the RefRef ref tool uh, to take off, uh, take offline the WikiLeaks website. We, we, we actually have the source code for the RefRef ref DDoS tool. It's pretty easy to find out on the Internet if you go look for it. It's a small program, maybe 50 lines long at most. It's written in Perl. Um, the key nutshell in what it does here is it makes a connection. Well, there's, there's a couple of key indicators here or key things to consider with this tool. First, they need to identify um, uh, a victim that is using MySQL uh, web server as their back-end web server because this uh, specifically exploits a, a function that only MySQL supports as far as I'm aware. And um, they have to find on that website that it – um, actually has a SQL injection vulnerability, uh, which unfortunately lots of websites do because uh, lots are poorly coded. Um, that's a whole other discussion probably for the future. In any event, the, uh, the critical thing here that it does is it runs uh, um, using the SQL injection vulnerability that they find, it will append in this SQL code to run a select benchmark uh, query. And I actually have it running here. I'm not even sure how many times this is here. It's uh, 99 billion times, it looks like. 
So they have this one function run 99 billion times. So what happens is, is by making one web request to this um, website that has a SQL injection vulnerability, uh, this command will have the MySQL server kind of spin its gears 99 billion times trying to execute this one function as a benchmark. And the benchmark function in MySQL is for you to test a function as a developer. You might want to, um, you know, see how long is this, execu uh, this uh, query going to take to execute. Uh, let me run it, you know, this many times to kind of see, do benchmark performance testing. Uh, it wouldn't be something you would run normally on your website, uh, but it's a back-end kind of feature that uh, people, developers, would want to use um, in evaluating their code. Uh, so, in a nutshell, things to consider if you are running MySQL uh, on your website, which lots are, because uh, there's, you know, that whole LAMP architecture, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, that a lot of website uh, hosting providers provide um, as a platform for people to do their development. Uh, just be cautious. Um, you would want to audit your log files for any kinds of requests that look like the previous example there of the select benchmark. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there is a way to disable the benchmark function. However, I would more encourage you to remove any type of SQL injection vulnerabilities you might have in your web application. Um, and uh, uh, a couple other things in order to, 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 to use this vulnerability that we mentioned here is the attacker has to be able to launch the, the, SQL, the benchmark function and he needs to know a SQL injection point of vulnerability. Um, maybe one of the PHP scripts has a vulnerability that he can, you know, use to leverage this uh, attack tool. So far, I don't know that we've seen a whole lot of these out there other than the proof of concepts. Um, the one thing I'm thinking is that um, when I look at this code, it's not very, someone, it's kind of tailored such that you kind of need to know that all I have to do is tack this onto the end of the URL in order to inject a SQL vulnerability. That might not always be the case, depending on how the website is vulnerable. So um, it does require, you know, uh, someone who's going to use this tool to upfront do a little legwork to find that something is vulnerable to a SQL injection, which hopefully most people aren't, well, I'm thinking most of the anonymous group may not, um, may not have the skill set to find that. But that's not going to be true for all of them. Some are very capable and can find that type of thing. Once they select a target, I think um, they will be able to use this kind of tool um, to very quickly take the system offline. Another thing is not a distributable denial of service tool. I should rewrite this slide. It's really just a denial of service tool. If you take one machine, all you have to do is make one request or make that request maybe just a handful of times, that web request, and it puts the machine into its own kind of uh, cycling loop where it just keeps trying this request or this SQL request over and over again inside itself. Right. So if, if I understand here correctly, John, it sounds like some things really need to be, um, you know, even if you if you feel that your website has been done well, wouldn't you recommend that uh, so some double checks be done on the website to make sure this kind of thing is not one of the targets? I think oh, way too often, if you allude to, alluded to it earlier, uh, probably a topic for another discussion. Uh, an awful lot of websites out there are uh, designed uh, with uh, get it to market quickly as opposed to uh, protect it well, and that uh, unfortunately makes them a lot of uh, vulnerable to a number of types of attacks, this one having a particular uh, objective in mind. Right. And there are lots of um, uh, kind of like free software such as um, you know, the, the forum bulletin board types of things um, or some of these content management systems that are out there that frequently come crop up with all kinds of SQL injection vulnerabilities because they're usually a community kind of uh, developed project and maybe one of the developers isn't as good as the rest of the group and uh, a SQL injection vulnerability slips into one of the modules that somebody had written in there. Yeah. All right, very good. Thank you, John. So uh, let's roll back to Jim here. Um, I think we're uh, going to return to our uh, mobility malware theme. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, this week we saw reports of another uh, new piece of Android malware, um, this one called Droid Deluxe, that was supposed to help uh, the user recover a forgotten password. 
And this actually has triggered a lot of discussion uh, in the community on whether or not this is really malware because it sort of does what it claims it's going, going to do, but it does it in, the, in a way that is not the preferred way and leaves you more vulnerable to other uh, you know, potential malicious software. Um, frankly, if it, if it leaves you, you know, if it opens it up, if it opens up your device, if it roots your, uh, your smartphone, I consider that malicious, but, you know, some debate on that. Um, so, you know, other than the fact that it's an, another one, um, there's not really a whole lot about this one in particular that I wanted to talk about. But it uh, also came on the heels of uh, a report by um, Trend Micro and another one by um, Kaspersky that uh, were looking at the amount of malware that has targeted the uh, Android devices in the last year. We, we saw the first uh, Android malware just a little over a year ago, um, but in the, in the last year we've seen quite a bit of it, and I think the uh, the, the Trend Micro report said something like a 1,400 percent increase in the last six months in the malware targeting um, the Android devices. And this graphic that I've got up here, which comes from a report by Kaspersky uh, shows uh, malware targeted at, at phones, not just the, the smartphones, but uh, target includes some of the older ones too. And um, what it shows here is that a lot of the malware targeting phones is targeting the Java um, virtual machines on these phones. But if you just isolate it to the uh, malware targeting the, the smartphones, you see the Androids here, um, and we've talked about this before, mostly because it's the more open platform. The Androids are the ones that have been targeted. So uh, the Kaspersky report says that of malware targeting the smartphones, 85% of it or something like that is targeting uh, the Androids right now. You'll notice the the iOS um, and the the BlackBerry um, here are only constitute less than one percent of of this malware targeting the phones. So. All right, good. Uh, so. Uh, Jim, I think one of the things that's probably worth pointing out here is, uh, although the, you, I think you'd mentioned about 1,100% growth in uh, malware associated with, uh, if I remember correctly, Android devices. That, did I get that correctly? 1,400% uh, is 1, what the, the trend report was claiming, yeah. 1,400% okay. uh, so increase. Um, I don't remember whether that was the last six months or the last 12 months, but, yeah, oh, it, it's... Obviously, a very significant increase, uh, but uh, the amount of malware that we're seeing in general, uh, that is for, well, let's say, wireline devices, the typical, uh, you know, desktop operating systems, still just a drop in the bucket. It's, it's still relatively small, but it's obviously growing much more quickly than what's targeting the, you know, the Windows platforms, for example, or... Absolutely. So the, uh, this is, I think, a development of the repertoire, the toolkits that will be used and over and over again to create more variations of, on the same theme, I expect. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about this many, many times in the future, I'm sure. Yep. And, uh, Jim, I wanted to ask uh, about this Droid Deluxe. Um, this isn't one like some of the other ones that you described that comes as a Trojan with other apps, right? This is a an app that stands on its own? Yeah, right? and that's, that's why some of the debate in the community about whether or not to really call this malware or, you know, 
risk wear or whatever. I'm not going to worry about the, the subtle distinctions, but yes, this one comes claiming to be uh, an application to help you recover a lost password. And it does this by rooting the phone and then changing the permissions on the databases, you know, the contacts database and something else, so that they're world readable. So in a sense, it may help you recover your password. So in that sense, it does sort of what it says it does, but it does it in a way that leaves you more vulnerable afterwards to, you know, to other things. Now any other application on the phone can read those databases because they've been made world readable. That's a good point. Thanks. Right. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, I think there's uh, some very good points made there. I think uh, the, the key thing being that um, you know perhaps making your device more vulnerable and not knowingly doing that is uh, a significant issue. Uh, let's go ahead forward to the uh, the weather report here. Uh, this last week I would describe as being a fairly mundane week, and I think this is kind of evident in the numbers that we're seeing in terms of the amount of activity we're seeing here. Let me use a brighter color. Uh, second, sorry about that. All right, so uh, the numbers that we're seeing here are not sig terribly significant, and many of the cases we've seen in the past, there have been uh, much larger numbers associated with these. But nevertheless, let's walk through some of the activity that's taken place. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with this uh, first one here, 5631. Uh, let me go ahead and switch over to the, uh, the page that addresses this particular one. And uh, this is, um, as I said, port 5631 TCP. Uh, this is actually a, a port that's used by the um, um, Symantec PC Anywhere application. So this is basically a remote access application. Uh, in previous weeks, we've been talking about um, uh, scanning activity, trying to target uh, uh, weak passwords on uh, RDP, a remote desktop protocol. Well, this is an application that has very similar capabilities, but uh, in fact, I think predates RDP as a, an application. So uh, there are really just a few sources to doing it, this scanning activity. We've seen some spikes of activity, but uh, certainly a little more aggressive activity in the last day or so, and uh, we thought you'd like to know about that. Uh, scanning activity on the order of, a, uh, you know, up to about 12 or 13 million probes per hour from just a few source addresses that uh, are located in China. Uh, next item here, let's take a quick look at port 23 activity. We've been reporting on this for uh, about two months now and uh, it is continuing to progress as, uh, as it had been. We're looking at 60 days of history here on uh, this diagram. It's combined with port 22 activity. We've been reporting that uh, the scanning activity on these two ports is clearly related. Uh, the majority of sources here that are doing the scanning activity are in Korea. Uh, we had been reporting in the past that it appeared that there was some sort of a problem that allowed a number of devices uh, for a particular, you know, associated with a particular carrier in Korea to have been uh, perhaps targeted and exploited and recruited into some sort of a botnet. So uh, we're looking at the number of sources that are doing that scanning. Uh, over time, the number of sources that have been doing that scanning has come down significantly. We saw a little bit of a spike of activity last week, uh, but it has seemed to uh, come back down again and seems to be sort of stabilizing at this point. So we still have, I looked at one report, it was still about 2,800 sources from Korea that were doing the scanning activity, the vast majority of the sources, uh, but that is still ongoing and uh, we're continuing to track that. Uh, the uh, next port here, uh, let's take a quick look. Um, we have a couple items, uh, let's see here. This is uh, port 3128 TCP. Uh, let's take a quick look at that one. Uh, this one actually happens to be associated with a squid proxy, basically a proxy application. Uh, it is very typical for us to see probing activity on the network looking for uh, proxies that either have weak protections or, or no protections whatsoever that can be used for anonymizing applica applications or activities on the Internet. Uh, again, this is a uh, case where we're seeing on the order of you know, uh, spikes on around 10 million probes per hour 
even on this port, we've seen activity in the past, uh, but what we're seeing that's a little bit different here is sort of a concentration of activity. That is, over the last couple of days, uh, a short period uh, late last week, uh, we've seen some uh, kind of focused activity, a lot of spiking activity in that. Uh, and again, it's about 10 million probes per hour that we're seeing. Also, coming from a small number of source addresses uh, that are located in China. Sort of a common theme in this, uh, this particular report along those lines. Uh, we do see a couple of other things here. Uh, this is uh, UDP port, P port 20, excuse me, UDP port 6257. Uh, and also UDP port uh, 3074. Uh, both of these appear to be not the same application, but both appear to be associated with P2P type activity. I would put them in the very low uh, risk category, but uh, certainly if you see activity that uh, looks um, uh, malicious to you, we'd like to hear from you about that and uh, we can investigate that further. Um, and then the last two I'd like to report on, uh, the next one here is Port 135 TCP. Uh, we issued an alert on Internet Protect associated with this. Uh, it is not a particularly significant issue in my opinion, uh, but we did want to make sure that you're aware of it. Uh, the reason I don't think it's particularly significant is because we do have some regular scanning activity on port 135. As you can see here, looking at the last 30 days, uh, there is clearly a baseline of about, say, 100 sources that we pick up, excuse me, about 400 sources scanning on that port at any particular time. Uh, but we did see some uh, spikes in activity in the last few days. It popped up to about 600 sources. So this is perhaps a, uh, a botnet that has um, uh, taken an interest in finding some port 135 activity. Also, last but, well, let's see, let me point out, uh, also, uh, we did pick up some scanning activity. Again, I've got the same error here. It's called the squid proxy. This is uh, also probably a proxy application port 8090. Uh, we're seeing some probing activity on that port as well, just in the last day or so. Um, and again, on the order of this is uh, peaking at about 6 million uh, probes per hour that we've seen. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that to see uh, how that develops. And then uh, last but not least, um, we have been reporting for several weeks now, port 3389 TCP. Uh, this is remote desktop protocol. Uh, it had been identified to be associated with the uh, Mordo worm that uh, Microsoft reported. Uh, it was basically looking for weak passwords. In fact, I think it may have been fact looking for uh, default passwords associated with the uh, RDP. Uh, at the time that that was reported, the activity dropped off significantly. That basically the, uh, the Mordo room worm activity was disabled. I suspect the command and control was cut off and it uh, basically disabled that activity. But um, around September 5th here, uh, we did see, it actually was on September 4th and then continuing in, all the way into September 6th, we did see sort of a resurgence of activity here. And this is, we're looking at the number of sources that are scanning on this port. Uh, it's in the thousands that we're measuring here. So about a thousand sources, it peaked up around uh, about 2,000 sources that we're scanning. Uh, this is a case where it appeared that for a very short period of time the, uh, the botnet that is associated with this, the command and control, may have been revived. Uh, that was short-lived and cut off. So we're uh, continuing to keep an eye on this. Uh, I think this is significant in the sense that although the mortar worm was discovered, uh, it was not clearly reported that the uh, botnet had been disabled. And in fact, it appears that that is, may not be entirely under control. And in fact, the, uh, the controllers here may in fact, the, the operators here may in fact be trying to sit low and seeing when the right time is to uh, turn on their already exploited devices. So we'll see how that progresses as it goes forward. Uh, I think that concludes the report for today. Uh, any final comments from the team? Yeah, Brian, I did want to make one real quick comment. Um, you know, we're recording this on the 8th of September, and this Sunday is the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and we just had, you know, Hurricane Irene come through and Hurricane Lee, and we've got three more of them in the Atlantic lining up. And it's just a reminder that, you know, the bad guys use these kinds of things, natural disasters or anniversaries like 9-11, uh, 
for in their phishing campaigns, in their scamming you know campaigns, set up fake websites. I know in the last couple of days I've seen uh, a couple of um, phishing uh, spam campaigns uh, claiming to be uh, raising funds for survivors of 9/11 victims or for 9-11 commemorative coins. And just a reminder that we all need to be vigilant and don't click on those silly links. But the bad guys are always going to take advantage of things like the natural disasters or these kinds of anniversaries to try to prey on the, you know, the, on the better instincts of, you know, of users. So yeah. just something to be aware of here as these hurricanes come through here and and with this anniversary. Yeah, absolutely. So the uh the, the tactics of appealing to emotions or curiosity is a uh, a popular tactic among the spammers and of you watching out for that. Thanks, Jim. Good comment. Okay, so uh let's uh go ahead and finish things up here. First of all let me thank the uh the folks that are on the call. Uh Jim Clausing, John Hogeboom, Dave Gross, uh thank you for your inputs. And the, uh, if you have feedback, suggestions on things we should uh, cover, or questions, you can reach us at cyberthreat at list.att.com. Uh, you can reach this program in a few different places. First on the AT&T Tech Channel, that's techchannel.att.com. Uh, or you can search for us in, uh, in, I, in iTunes or through YouTube. Uh, just search for AT&T Cyber Threat Report. And uh, thank you very much for listening today or watching if you're doing that. And uh, look forward to talking with you again.